remember just thinking to myself, like, this is just football, basically, but in real life. And you've got to keep grinding. It's the fourth quarter, and you've got to find a way to get it done. How do most agents who don't have access to the secrets that the top agents in our industry hoard to themselves grow and prosper in today's real estate environment? That's the question, and this video podcast is the answer. I'm Pat Hyman, and welcome to Real Estate Rockstars. Real Estate Rockstars, this is Aaron Amuchastegui. Today, I have such a treat for you guys. You know, I get to listen to, and you guys get to listen to me interview Elliot Hoyt. You know, I just got to chat to Elliot for just a couple minutes. And one of the most exciting, fun things for me that you guys have heard is Elliot has been a longtime avid listener of the podcast. And so today gets to be this exciting time where we get to talk about, you know, what he does now. So he, there were times he got to listen to the podcast and learn, and now he's going to be here to try to help share his story with you guys. There's going to be so much to his story. You know, he's an ex D one football player originally from England. You know, he played as a, as a, as a lineman you know, at Porsche brand ambassador, all sorts of different things that you've done that kind of led you to real estate and lots of ups and downs, like some rock bottom and coming back and to success. So I am so so excited to get going with this. The Elliot, thanks for joining us. How are you? Thanks for having me on, man. It's kind of surreal to be here, but hey. Yeah, the uh, you have earned it, man. The uh, I, I said there's nothing that I get more excited about than having people turn from listeners into guests. And so the, you know, there's so much for us to dig into, but really at the beginning, I wanted to just kind of give you some time to tell us your story. I think the listeners won't be disappointed in getting to hear kind of how you got here in the process. How did you, how did you get from England to Boise? How'd you go from all these different industries to real estate? Like, uh, let's have at it, man. Tell us, tell us how you got here. I'll skip the boring parts of, of, the, of the birth and the childhood for the most part. But yeah, I'm from I'm from a, a, a small town called Tavistock in England. It's about half an hour north of Plymouth, which is the next biggest city. It's about three hours southwest of London. So I was born and raised in England, um, didn't move to America um, until I was 18. Um, so I grew up in England, um, never really thought about real estate as an option my entire life because in England things are done a little bit differently I always wanted to be an athlete so I played rugby most of my childhood and started playing football in England as a club sport when I was about 16 and um, long story short uh, back in my rugby days this uh, this American uh, high school team came over on like a, a rugby tour of England and they had one particular guy playing for them, this high school team his name was Chase Baker and uh, I hung out with him a lot when he was in in, in Tavistock and when he was uh playing because my dad was asked to guest coach this American team. So Chase, I lost contact with him for a couple of years. I started playing football, like I said, when I was 16 um, mm -hmm. as a club sport. And I was watching ESPN. I was watching this team called Boise State with a blue field. And I was like, wait, hang on a second. That's that's Chase that I met all those years ago. Um, so yeah, I was uh, at the time I was uh, just graduating high school, stacking groceries and playing club club football and uh reached out to chase and saw him on facebook and i was like hey chase you remember me he's like hey man yeah i remember you uh, how are you doing i was like good he's like how big are you now and i said i'm pretty big now and he <laughs> says you started playing football and i said yeah and he said can you can i see your film so i sent my film out to chase and chase shared it with the uh, the coaches at boise state i came out to summer camp in 2011 at the age of 18 and uh coach chris peterson offered me a scholarship uh, on the second day so that's how i got to america it was on the back of uh playing football so I played four years for Boise State, um, won a Fiesta Bowl and achieved a bunch of stuff. Um, went on to become a, a Porsche brand ambassador um, for two years after college, right after I graduated, and then kind of stumbled into real estate by accident. Had a chance encounter with the CEO of our brokerage, who also played uh, football at Boise State. He's about 10 years older than me. His name's Nick Schleckaway. So be be before you jump after that, th what yeah, years did you play football at Boise State? Uh, so I played 2012 to 2016. Yeah. So the, so I'm a, I'm an, I'm an Oregon duck. The, uh, oh, so, so our, yeah. so man, I have had our, our moments of the ducks playing football against Boise state. And yes, Boise is super unique. They've got the bright blue field and yep. they have, uh, you know, they have taken away our, our big moments a couple times the uh, out there. So definitely one of the rivals. So I had to, had to figure out if you were on, on those teams at that time and you sure were. So, um, so all right, back to your story. So the, yeah. go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, so, uh, so where was I at? So yeah, I, uh, graduated college, um, wasn't going to be playing football anymore and, and, uh, was a, a Porsche brand investor for two years. So basically I, 
would help people design, buy, sell Porsches. Um, and then, you know, two years into that job, I was doing really well. I actually won a national award for that um, and kind of reached the ceiling almost. I had a chance encounter with the CEO of our, our brokerage at Amazon Madison here, Nick. Um, Nick played football at Boise State um, as well, a little bit older than me. And I ran into Nick and Nick was like, hey, man, I heard you're killing it, selling those cars. I was like, yeah, it's, it's going pretty well. He, goes, he said to me, have you ever thought about selling real estate? And I was like, I mean, I thought about it. It's kind of a cool idea, but I never really thought it'd be something I could do. Anyway, a couple of weeks passed and I kind of mulled on it. I was like, you know what? Let's give it a go. I've got nothing to lose. Um, you know, real estate gives you a much bigger ceiling because if you're your own boss, you kind of can make it whatever you want. And that kind of appealed to me. So I got my license in July 2018. I um, jumped into it headfirst um, and uh, it was rough the first, I think it was seven or eight months. Um, I had nothing, no I really wasn't getting any traction, holding open houses every, you know, three or four days a week. Um, and then finally got a breakthrough in, uh, in 2019, March, 2019 was when I actually got my first buyer who also was listing to, and then just rolled from there. It's been crazy. So it's only actually been, I think 17 months since I really got into the business, if you want to call it that. Um, and it's been kind of a roller coaster. Rockstar Nation, this is Aaron Amuchasegui. Hey, I hate to interrupt the current podcast that you're listening to, but I am so excited to share this with you. I just finished interviewing the original host of this podcast, my good friend, Pat Hyben. Now, I got to talk to Pat about how he started his real estate career and a whole bunch of tips and tactics that he used to be successful. So if you haven't listened to it yet, go check out State of the Market number 49. On there, I get to talk to Pat about all those different things. You know, and in there too, he talked a lot about his six steps for seven figures book and training program that he built over the last couple of years. And I realized I haven't done a good enough job of reminding all of you lately about all of the resources that we built for you out there. So if you want to check out Pat's course, we've got like a three minute summary video when you go to it. It includes so many easy to follow tips that you can follow on it like a day to day basis. You get email reminders, all sorts of different things that come with that course. You find that you go to rebusuniversity.com, R-E-B-U-S, rebusuniversity.com. Look at courses. You can find the six steps for seven figures book. And really, there's a whole bunch of other courses in there too. Our normal prices used to be $1,500 or $2,000 a course. These are real deal professional courses. But now uh, during quarantine, a lot of them are priced down like 90 bucks, 95 bucks. So we've slashed the prices so we know right now is the time for everybody to be focusing on growth and education, especially while they're feeling like they don't have as much to do. And if you go in there and you figure like there's a lot of different courses you want, maybe you don't want to buy the a la carte. You go to futureofrealestatetraining.com and you can get access to all of our different courses for 97 bucks a month. I think there's a discount on there if you go a year or there's even like a lifetime option you can pay. You get access to every course we've ever put on Rebus University for as long as we have it. So go check out those options, Rebus University or futureofrealestatetraining.com. All right, back to your podcast. Sorry for the interruption. Um, 2018 and the 2018 before that kind of success in 2019. Um, I remember vividly December was rolling around. I was down to my last $17. Like I had no money. I, was, I put everything I had, took all my savings out and put it into marketing myself for real estate. And it kind of was falling at the wayside. I remember end of December, uh, the, the the dues were coming up, kind of like my, my yearly dues were coming up. I had 17 bucks and I signed up for Uber. So I was driving Uber in December of 2018 to try and get the money to pay for my dues to keep going for another year. And I remember listening to real estate rock stars driving around rock bottom. And I mean rock bottom. I had no money, no hope. But I was like, you know what, to keep trundling along. And I managed to make it to mark somehow. And here we are almost two years on now. So. Yeah. The, so you were, you were practicing as an agent working hard. Like you she said, you're doing like three or four open houses a week, but it took, how long did it take before you got, so you said like 17 months before you started getting any traction? It, it was, it was, it was seven to eight months before I, I think. So I, I got my license in July. So July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March. So almost nine, it was eight, eight solid months. I didn't have a single deal in that eight months. Um, most people would quit, but <laughs> yeah, I'm too slow in the. I think it's important to share that, right? Yeah. We have we get so many rock stars on here. You know, we sometimes we get to interview these people that are thirty under thirty, and they've had their license for a year, and they and they made hundreds of thousands of dollars, mm -hmm. and which is great, and it's possible, and people have that, and they've got lots of things we can learn. But a more common story in real estate is, hey, this is hard. I'm working really hard. I'm doing, I'm knocking on the doors. I'm doing this stuff and it's just not happening. And I, I remember when I was restarting my, my flipping business back in like 2014, 
right? And the, the same thing, I went from making, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a month to signing up to be an Uber driver, mm-hmm. right? To going like, hey, I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll put my house on Airbnb, I'll, I'll, I'll become an Uber driver, I'll do all these, and the just to do whatever it takes. And what I love about that story, right, is you were, that could have been a time to say, you know what, I don't have the money to renew my dues. It's time for me to do something else. And instead of giving up with that, you said, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to become an Uber driver so I can pay my real estate dues, right? So I can start, you know, to do this instead and then make that traction. So did you have a moment when it clicked that you thought, all right, now it's working? Did it, was it, was it like, hey, your funnel was now just finally reaping the benefits or did something change at that point? I mean, and, and, and again, the thing I love is you're, so you're listening to real estate rock stars, you're hearing all these tips, you're hearing all these things. Hopefully that helped keep you motivated that said, hey, I can, I can do this if I just stick with it. Did, it, did anything major happen that helped that trigger? Did it feel like it was a day and night change? You know, I don't know. I don't think there was a particular trigger. I was doing everything the right way. Believe it or not, you know, I was kind of learning from others. The way I've always looked at this business is there's no need to reinvent the wheel. There's always someone that's either been in the same situation as you or there's something you can take from someone else's story to help apply to you. So I kind of felt like I didn't have the perfect model because no one does have the perfect model. I just think it was just it was just a, a case of, you know, a compounded interest. When the floodgates opened, they opened. Um, you know, I was doing the same stuff. I was doing open houses as much as I could. I was talking to people, having those, you know, having those sit down coffees, having those conversations, that kind of stuff with the right people. Um, and because I was consistent doing that for eight months, then it opened up. I think a little bit of it is chance sometimes. There is a there is a definitely amount of chance in real estate. You do stumble upon certain stuff. Um, but I wouldn't change it for the world because that really rough period has made me grateful for the things I have now. Because if I had it easy, you know, any, I'm not saying anyone could do this, but within reason, anyone could, you know, have a great fast start and, and get out and make hundreds of thousands of dollars. But you don't appreciate it, in my opinion, as much as going through the struggle. Much like as an athlete, you know, I've gone through struggles physically or, you know, whatever that be on the field, it translates to real life. And I didn't think I, I didn't put my life together, I don't think, until December when I was doing, I was Ubering on number one night. I remember just thinking to myself, like, this is just football, basically, but in real life. And you've got to keep grinding. It's the fourth quarter and you've got to find a way to get it done. The, I mean, that is not the first time I've heard the comparison of kind of sports and, and athletics and the, I was a wrestler in high school and man, that was the, I, I was a, I was a scrawny kind of really small kid, but, but the, but that was a sport that took just this crazy amount of like drive and you keep going no matter what, when you want to give up and the, that helped me a lot in life. There's a sign behind you right now. It says tough times don't last tough people do. Yep. Right. And so you're like, that is like such a summary of your story of, of, you know, just keep going, right. If keep going, push through tough times, don't last tough people do right now. We're, we have this, this bizarre coronavirus epidemic, whatever you want to call what's going on. Like we have, you know, people held in quarantine. We have others that aren't, we have some businesses that are closing down. We have others that are thriving is this very, very strange time but something to remind all the listeners out there, just like Elliot had this big rough patch, right? Right now, a lot of us are having a crazy rough patch in our world, but tough times don't last, you know, tough people do and being able to rise. So what are some of the things that being an athlete, you know, I mean, you gave, we gave one of the examples. Do you have any other examples of how being an athlete helped prepare you for, for life, for life in real estate, uh, anything like that? I could turn this into a 12 hour podcast. So I'll try I'll try and keep it as as on point as possible. Um, I think uh, in, in life for me, um, some of the stuff we used to do physically for, for for training and practice outside of the game, because a lot of people don't you know realize when you watch college football, you see um, you know maybe you see less. I work out the time we spent. You look when you watch the game, that's less than 0.1 percent of the time you're actually a student athlete and going through what you go through. So everyone kind of sees the glitz and glamour, but the hard work you have to put in behind the scenes, much like as an agent, is the same way. We have to do all this stuff behind the scenes that no one gets to see. And you have to be okay to do the work and understand that not everyone's going to understand that, you know, that's just one facet of, of, of what we do. So I, that's kind of how I kind of saw the translation because I realized there's a lot of work I'd have to do that no one would ever see before they see the success. Um, and more specifically to the things I, I did as an athlete and as a Division One um, football player, physically, I put I pushed myself to the absolute limits and mentally sometimes too, you know, during training camp, you, you know, you're going through two days and you have to, you know, check in for meetings and well, you have to be mentally alert the whole time. Whenever I have a hard patch myself, I go back to what I went through with football. So, okay, I have this inspection contingency I need to get through. 
or have this negotiation. If I could physically push myself through the things I had to do with football, this is a breeze. So that's kind of how I apply that side of stuff. Um, and then the other, the other thing that I think is anyone can apply to their life is um, I always talk with my clients or talk to my clients about managing expectations. If you can manage your clients' expectations, no matter who they are, whether they're an investor or if it's a family buying a house, selling a house, if you manage the expectations, there cannot be excuses because everyone knew up front what to expect. That's the same with athletics. With football, we have a playbook we have to, we have to adhere to, and you have to do your role within that play and within that team. We know going into a game that we have this expectation of us to achieve a certain job or outcome. Same with our clients, same with our business. Know the expectations and manage them. And that's what helps you be successful. Yeah. The, and like you said, there, there's, there's so many kind of comparisons that are out there. What about selling Porsches when it comes to what's, what, is it easier to sell a million dollar house or, or, or a Porsche? And was there anything from that business? Did it, was there skills that translated or is it a completely different animal? I think there's a Venn diagram and it almost overlaps perfectly between people that sell million dollar houses and people that sell, that buy and sell Porsches. So I, I can kind of talk a little bit about both of those. Um, so yeah, there's definitely crossover because um, I think if anything, it sounds somewhat crazy um, in a kind of a, a macro view, selling and helping people buy and sell houses is somewhat easier than a luxury vehicle because at the end of the day, a home is a necessity. Whereas a, a luxury vehicle, it's kind of a nice thing to have. So if you know, I learned and I cut my teeth negotiating and helping some of the most you know affluent and um, intelligent individuals in my town that made the transition to real estate relatively simple as far as you know negotiation expectations go. Because I dealt with people that were smart and kind of knew what they were doing and were savvy. Um, I think service wise, I learned a lot. You know, when someone was buying a vehicle that's you know six figures. There's a certain level of of service and treatment that's expected. I try to kind of transfer, you know, okay, how do I treat these people that are picking up their, you know, their dream vehicle? How do I treat them when, you know, when I'm in real estate now and someone's buying or selling a house? This is the biggest purchase or sale of most people's lives from a, you know, a residential standpoint. And same thing with someone buying a luxury vehicle. So how can I make them feel special? What can I do and how can I treat them? People don't remember necessarily what you say, but they remember how you make them feel. How can I make this experience as good and as fun, as enjoyable for, for my clients as I can and kind of transfers over. People remember how they feel. Rockstar Nation, this is Aaron Amuchasegui. Hey, I hate to interrupt the current podcast that you're listening to, but I am so excited to share this with you. I just finished interviewing the original host of this podcast, my good friend, Pat Hyben. You know, I got to talk to Pat about how he started his real estate career and a whole bunch of tips and tactics that he used to be successful. So if you haven't listened to it yet, go check out State of the Market number 49. On there, I get to talk to Pat about all those different things. You know, and in there too, he talked a lot about his six steps for seven figures book and training program that he built over the last couple of years. And I realized I haven't done a good enough job of reminding all of you lately about all of the resources that we built for you out there. So if you want to check out Pat's course, we've got like a three minute summary video when you go to it. It includes so many easy to follow tips that you can follow on it like a day to day basis. You get email reminders, all sorts of different things that come with that course. You find that you go to rebusuniversity.com, R-E-B-U-S, rebusuniversity.com. Look at courses. You can find the six steps for seven figures book. And really, there's a whole bunch of other courses in there too. Our normal prices used to be $1,500 or $2,000 a course. These are real deal professional courses. But now uh, during quarantine, a lot of them are priced down to like 90 bucks, 95 bucks. So we have slashed the prices so we know right now is the time for everybody to be focusing on growth and education, especially while they're feeling like they don't have as much to do. And if you go in there and you figure like, like there's a lot of different courses you want, maybe you don't want to buy the a la carte. You go to futureofrealestatetraining.com and you can get access to all of our different courses for 97 bucks a month. I think there's a discount on there if you go a year or there's even like a lifetime option you can pay to get access to every course we've ever put on Rebus University for as long as we have it. So go check out those options, Rebus University or futureofrealestatetraining.com. All right, back to your podcast. Sorry for the interruption. You know, one of the stories that you told Curtis was, you know, so you keep a, you keep like a warm, hot lead list. And I don't know if it was Christmas last year that the, so you did this kind of big, you know, big gifting to anybody that was kind of a potential. When you talk about like, they remember how you made them feel. Why don't you tell us about that a little bit? Yeah. So I, um, I have a, a kind of a hot and warm lead list. I hate even calling people leads because I feel like it, it detracts from the people behind the name. You know? Yeah. I told, yeah. I get it. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. 
but yeah, I have, a, I have a hot and a warm list. So a hot list is basically anyone anyone that's imminent, whether they're an investor or you know someone that's buying a primary residence or secondary. I have a hot list of people that are ready to make a transaction, make an offer, make a sale or list in the next week or so, essentially. Maybe even maybe a month. The warm list are people that um, either I've had conversations with about you know transacting real estate in the near future. Or you're on the warm list if I think you're going to do something you don't know yet. There's a lot of people, and you know this as agents, you see the signs when someone's ready to purchase or you know sell a house long before they realize when there's kind of changes in circumstances. So that list, I carry that list, is always rolling and evolving. And every quarter and every couple of months, I send out meaningful, thoughtful gifts or things that are helpful to these potential clients or clients um, to kind of keep top of mind and to bring something genuine and helpful to their lives because they do remember those things. Like I said, they remember how you made them feel. So, for example, we just uh, just last week sent out uh, coolers, like little little uh, like kind of lunch tote coolers with my name on them, like my branding, and it had a little treat inside, a ten dollar gift card to go pick up some ice cream at one of the local. Um, ice cream shops it's just saying hey thinking of you it's getting hot keep your drinks cool grab an ice cream on me it's got nothing to do with real estate essentially nothing really yeah. to do with real estate but it's something that's thoughtful and people remember that is that is so great the uh and now i can't even get out of my head too like the idea of calling people leads instead of like partners or potentials or things like that because yeah. it really is such a such a relationship business so you're top of mind with that you're reaching out to people and then you know it just it, it just ends up balancing out so how many so now that you are, yeah, you've gotten through, a t- now you're a successful agent. How many deals did uh, are you going to do this year? How many deals did you do last year? So last year, um, I had 30 transaction sites for $9.3 million in year one. Um, average price was, uh, I think it was three thirty. dollars um, This year, we're looking at 54 sites for anywhere between 18 to $23 million. That is freaking awesome. So 18 to 23 million. How many, you say we, who's we, how many people are we? I say we, I have an assistant. Um, Her name's Shalise and she's about as important to me as I am to myself because without her, I really can't get a lot done. It kind of takes, it does take a a, a joint effort when you get to that kind of level of production to give good client care. So I always say we, because there's two of us and we spend a lot of time together. So I do, I do all of the, the actual transactional related stuff. She's kind of behind the scenes keeping, she's a glue to keep stuff together, you know? So everybody listening to that, it took seven to eight months to even like actually get a transaction, get anything happening where he realized this was maybe the business that was going to work for him. And now the, the volume that he's hitting with just an assistant, with just a helper and being able to, uh, now she's obviously a great assistant, right? But a team of two being able to do that much volume is awesome. You know, the, so right now Boise is a super saturated market. Right. Yeah. Like there's, you know, when, and, and by saturate, that means there's a lot of, there's a lot of agents out there, right? There's a lot of people out there hustling, trying to get business. The, what are some of the ways that you set yourself apart from that, from all the other agents? So other than the kind of the aforementioned stuff with kind of those thoughtful gifts, um, it sounds kind of not silly, but people always, I, I asked a lot by other agents, you know, what makes you successful? Um, and it sounds really dumb being a good agent. And it sounds super silly, but if, at the core, it really makes sense. It, I've always heard these sayings, you know, your next transaction lies in the transaction you're in right now because referral business is massive in our business. Um, so the things that I do different, I, I just try to be a good agent. So I try and communicate well with other agents. That's one thing I noticed when I first got in the business. Unfortunately, you know, there's just over seven, I think it's just over 7,000 agents in our market, which is, is a huge number. I found that communication was a really weak point on average with most agents. So, okay, up front, it's re- I'm a communications major in college. It's really not hard to you know be communicative properly and efficiently. So being communicative with other agents and with clients is really, really important. Um, the other thing is being knowledgeable. So I, I always, I think, I feel like I have this mindset of being a sponge. You have to treat your brain like a sponge. Be around people that you want to be like or that do a good job already and ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. I feel like many agents and many people in life feel that asking questions and trying to learn new stuff is a sign of weakness. It's not. And every time you get a question answered that you had a you know a question for, that's one more thing in the memory bank. That's one more tool in your toolbox that you can apply and use in the next transaction to better serve your client. It's it's funny. We've had we've had a couple of people come on the podcast and talk about that. That so much of like it really is some of it actually is simple. Like yes, be a really good agent. Like life is long. And sometimes people forget that I've done transactions with agents that I say afterward, blacklist that agent. I'm never going to work with them again. Right. I'm never going to do that again. And the same thing happens with customers and clients. Right. So like remembering it's really easy to be uh, short minded, 
right? Like get the money now, get the deal now or whatever, but being that long-minded of realizing, hey, that's it's, it's going to turn into their, you know, to their friend. To, it, there's all sorts of different things that can happen that get to lead there. So I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that because that's an important reminder for everybody out there to that the transaction that you're in right now is going to help you in that transaction later or could potentially, like it could potentially get you a lot more deals or the way that you act with this client with this agent, with this anybody could potentially kill a ton of future deals. And, and if you're just better, if you're just your best and better then that gets to add up. So the, you still send notes every day? Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a big handwritten card guy, handwritten notes. Um, I, I need to do better. I'm, I'm all about integrity and being honest and accountable and I need to do better at sending them. I try and send at least one a day. Um, whenever I have an interaction, almost always with someone, whether it's new or it's a rekindled interaction, I'll send a, either a, a thank you card or just or, or something that's handwritten that says, hey, I was thinking about you, great conversation, refer back to something we spoke about. Um, I feel like handwritten cards are, 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 are notes are, are impactful because we're so busy in, in today's world and we're so used to sending texts and using our cell phone to communicate. It's almost like, you know, handwriting a note is a lost art. Not only does that, you know, show that you care about someone, but it gives you a time to reflect too. It kind of, it's that gratitude thing. When you can be grateful for talking to people and grateful for the interactions, it kind of comes back to you. And it's kind of a wholesome thing. Yeah. You know, people out there listening right now, because we're trying to set ourselves apart, not only in business, but also just in experiences. The We have a lot more time on our hands than we normally do. We're not driving as many places. So the sending people a note, you know, both it, it's not only good for them, but like Elliot mentioned, it's it's good for yourself. It's like this meditation gratitude thing. Whenever we you're know, keeping a gratitude list is like the thing that all the masterminds tell you and all the like the public speakers tell you, like always be grateful. And it's even more important to be grateful when times are really strange and we're living in a really strange time. And so I love that idea of more handwritten notes because it combines both of those things. Like it's a, it's a gift. People think about you and it helps you with gratitude. So how are you getting new, new clients now? So the, is there, is there, do you have a niche? Do you have something special that you focus on to get, get people in or is it all word of mouth now for people? So that's an interesting, interesting topic. Um, I, we, you, I, I feel like we're told as agents from a lot of different sources, get a niche, get a niche, get a niche, and yep. niche down, find out what you want to do. And that's okay for some people. Um, but I feel like one of the dangers with that is if you become known as the person that only does that, if that source of, uh, of, of lead or source of business dries up or changes, it can be quite hard to pivot and adapt. So it sounds super corny and cheesy, but when people say, what's your niche? I say people. And it sounds crazy, but it's true because if you want a referral business, you need to be a people person. Um, one of my mentors who I, I still speak to um, on a pretty regular basis is our broker. His name's Matt Bowsher, and he's he's normally Idaho's number in, in the top three producing agents. Um, and Matt always talks about you know treat, be be the rock star and treat your clients um, a certain way, and the referral business comes. So with that being said, you can't really pick and choose, you know, necessarily what price point or what things you buy and sell. But what I will say is um, it's only year two and the majority of my business is referral. It's two, two places, referral and then Instagram has been a massive source of business for me. Um, and it's not even necessarily intentional either. I'm quite a genuine and open person on Instagram and I try and relate back to work when I can. I often have people kind of, you know, send me a DM and ask me questions about real estate or, or kind of keep in touch with me that way. And that's been last year, I had five or six transactions that originated from Instagram alone. It was, it was somewhat unintentional, which is me being consistent in, in posting and consistent in posting stories and just interacting with people and trying to be, you know, trying to use that as a tool. So. Yeah. Social media, we tell people, I mean, when you're a real estate agent, you tell everybody you're an agent. Right. And the, and the more they get to see you and see that you're an agent, then people by chance go, Oh, I need an, I actually need an agent. Let me see who's, who, who's t again, that top of mind type thing. You know, so usually at this part of the podcast, I say, Hey, you know, if you were a new agent, what would you, what would you tell yourself? What advice would you give to a new agent? And I'm going to put a little different twist on it this time. Right. So the part of your story is, I mean, just pushing so hard for seven months and hitting rock bottom. I bet there are hundreds and thousands of people out there listening right now that are five, six, seven months into this, maybe a couple months into this thinking it's not for me, right? They're pushing, they, they're, they're having a, t a really tough time. Based on your experience, 
you got through that tough time, you kept going, you were able to go back to your other experiences. What would you be telling those people? What advice would you give the people that, that need to break through the wall that, that are just wanting to give up? You know, the, what were some things that helped you along the way? It, that's a really good question. It's, it's really tough because I thought there's not necessary an answer that can work for everyone. Um, for me personally, I, I can only speak personally. So I'm going to give you advice based on my mindset. and Hopefully it rubs off on some people. When you commit to do something, I was always taught by my, my parents and my dad in particular, you need to finish it. And my mindset was going into this um, career and even towards, you know, when it hit rock bottom is I will, ref I refused and I always refuse to let myself talk myself out of doing something or to allow um, you know, myself to quit. If I'm going to fail at this, it's going to be because of my circumstances and there's absolutely no way there's going to be me forgiving myself. I think it's another saying, and I'm, I'm one of those guys that was always taught sayings, but that the, the, the pain of, of regret and the pain of quitting because you decided to is a lot stronger than the pain of having to stop because you literally can't do it anymore. I feel like as people, we talk ourselves out of the situation more often than we actually get put out of the situation because you can no longer do it. Yeah. So I think it's keeping that positive mindset more than anything. And I know it's hard to do that when you hit bottom. Um, but I hope my story is enough for people to realize if you're consistent and you stick to a plan, you do it over and over and over again. And it, you cannot be denied. You just, you cannot be denied in the end. Some way, somehow you can't be denied if you do stuff consistently and do it the right way. Yeah. The, the pain of looking back on giving up is worse than the pain the moment you gave up. Yeah. I like that. The that's like a, I do Ironman races and, and sprints and, you know, and all sorts of things. I've heard that a lot from like the people that you know quit in the marathon on like mile seventeen because of how bad they hurt, and then later the regret that they have is so much stronger than the pain they were feeling at the time. That is so hard when you're in the moment to actually understand that, right? When you're feeling the pain, it, it, the brain wants to talk us out of things. And it's just about, you know, I've seen a couple of people with like a mantra, like remember tomorrow, right? Yep. Like just, just remember tomorrow. Think about tomorrow as you're going through this, not right now, because just tomorrow you can go through, how am I going to feel if I stop? How am I going to feel if I keep going, you know, all through that. And I think that could be remembered next month. Remember next year, just keep you know, going through that part. What's your, uh, so what's your favorite part about real estate? Or go ahead. You have go ahead to add one thing to that. And this is something that I learned, um, was something I learned in my football days. Uh, our seniors uh, each year before camp or during camp would sit and address the team. It was our open open chance to talk about anything. And they, in part, part wisdom, kind of like we're doing now, onto the younger players. I was a freshman. And this one guy um, called Faraji Wright, who, um, who's a, he's actually a pretty successful uh, artist now. Um, he said... The days and weeks go slow, but the months and years go fast. That's the most profound thing I've ever heard to this day. And, and basically what it's saying is what you just said is we look back at stuff and we realize how either insignificant or how it didn't really last that long. Whatever the pain we went through, whatever suffering we went through, didn't really last that long in the grand scheme of things because the, the days and weeks go slow, but the months and years go fast. So you, if you can get through the next day, you can get through the next week. It turns into a year and a month pretty quick. But anyway, that's my, that's my yeah. one piece. I mean, our life is full of moments, yeah. right? Life is full of, so there, we all have these substantial moments where something happened and we pushed through and it became that thing that, that got us there. And I think now, right now, the, again, it's a time when so many people are really crushing it in their businesses. And it's a time when so many people aren't, you know, when so many people are just having a really tough time adjusting to whatever this new normal is for however long it's going to last. And so that one foot in front of the other, that one day at a time that remember tomorrow. And then I, one of the other things that you said there is you made a commitment to yourself of, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to give it this long. I'm going to, I'm going to do it for this long. And when I first quit my job to go become an entrepreneur, I had like six weeks of savings, right? And it was the same thing. I gave myself a few months of time and said, Hey, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I've got at least enough for, for a few months. And so that's what I'm going to, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try this for at least a few months before I, before I have to give up there, before I have to try something else. And so make that deal with yourself, make that contract for what you're going to do next. And then, and then really put, putting forth the effort. I also really liked Elliot when you talked at the beginning, like, you know, you were the first seven months, you were doing everything you were supposed to do. You were putting forth all of the effort and doing everything. And then it wasn't even like all of a sudden something clicked and worked better. It just it just, you just finally got to reap the rewards. You didn't change anything. It was just, no, you kept doing the process, 
But the way that real estate works a lot of the time is you keep doing the process, you keep doing the process, and it's going to come from the most random places. You know, said like there's chance, there's like chance and luck that you're in the right place and that you meet the right person and that sort of stuff happens. But I tell you what, that chance and luck is increased and improved. Like, like it just happened to be that that open house, you get three leads right? And the other 15 open houses, you got none. So there's some chance and luck that it was so good that day. But if you weren't there every single time, every single week, putting forth the effort, you don't give chance a chance uh, yep. to work. So the, so what are, what are you the most excited about over this next year with, with real estate, with your career? What are you doing next? Uh, yeah, <laughs> there's so much, there's so much. I feel like I'm at this fork in the road with my career. Cause I could take it one of many different ways. I've, I've had the fortune to, you know, help people at, at different price points, you know, lower price points. And it's been, you know, a struggle has been rewarding to get them into a house or get their house sold or, you know, the, the upper echelon. So, I, you know, right now I'm currently in a $1.6 million transaction. The other side has been really fun to do um, the high end stuff. And then I've also worked a lot with investors and the investors, you know, whether it's been flipping or if it's been, um, you know, long term holds, you know, rentals, that kind of stuff has been enjoyable too. I think the biggest thing I'm looking forward to is I, I need to make a decision probably in the next uh, couple months, maybe even weeks here, how my business is going to look. And I think that's going to involve bringing on more people um, to, you know, not just cast the net wider, but to be able to give better service to my clients. So I'm excited to see, you know, in a year's time from now, what my, you know, quote unquote team looks like and, and how we're going to structure that. I, I like to lead people. I like to be a leader. So I'm kind of excited to get back to my kind of athlete days and have a team again, maybe here soon. And, see how I can kind of help others be the best version of themselves. Yeah, you know, the, that is an exciting time. And, and one of the coolest things that you just said too, is it's about being able to provide better service, mm -hmm. right? If you grow your team with the intent that you're going to be providing better service to your clients, to your people, that everybody's experience is better, that has to pay off, right? So many people say, I want to grow my team so I can grow my revenue and grow this. But if that focus gets to be so I can provide better service, the rest of that stuff will happen, but it's just, an, it's just a mindset thing. Yeah. Right. Like if, if the focus is we're going to make people's lives better, then uh, then money follows, you know, yeah. as, as we get to do that. So so you're you're out in Boise. You're going to continue building up that business and finding, you know, some other kind of uh, ways to grow your team and lead a team and get to use some of that other stuff. If people want to reach out to you, Elliot, if they if, if they have questions, if they want to send you referrals, the what's the best way for them to find you and get to talk to you? Uh, it depends on your age, I guess. It depends on your use of social media. I'm a big Instagram guy, so that's one. Uh, my Instagram user is at Elliot, that's at E-L-L-I-O-T underscore H-O-Y-T-E dot com. If you're listening, give me a follow. I'll follow you back. Um, and then other than that, um, probably email. Um, I, I try and get back to my emails. I love to help people. I love having conversations. You know, everyone loves a referral, but it's also nice to kind of help people out. So, you know, my email is, is the best way to get at me other than Instagram. And that's my first name and my last name. So that's Elliot at ElliotHoyt.com. Elliot at ElliotHoyt.com. The, you know, Elliot, I think we said it at the beginning. There's, I love it when people get to come on and say, hey, I was a listener and now I get to come provide value. Something that made today's even more special for me is that you were a longtime listener during a really, really rough part of your life, right? A rough part of your career. And, Hello. you know, and getting to hear like that, it, it gets me, it gets me really emotional and excited that we got to come on and share that part of it. Cause I know that you're not alone in that, but you, um, but those listeners are some of the ones that are, that this stuff is for. Right. Like we have, we get hundreds of thousands of listeners, right? This is, this is the biggest real estate agent podcast around, but I tell you what, when we get to touch the people that really need to be touched, they really need something. They really need a, a pick me up and some of that motivation. I mean, today was really special. Um, and listeners, if you're out there and it resonated, you know, I, I never ask people to share it to forward the podcast around to go tell people about the podcast. We grow plenty, but this is one of those special podcasts that if you got something out of it, I would, I would beg you to, you know, to copy it, put it on your social media, you know, put it on, on Facebook or email to some friends, or even just text it to a couple people. Just say, hey, this is one you should go listen to. We don't ask often for people to go kind of share the podcast, like I said, because it grows. But this is a message that I think a lot of people need to hear right now. And I would really appreciate it if you guys go share it. You know, Elliot, the, I'm going to go follow you on Instagram, man. I'm sure we will continue some conversations on there. But the, uh, I am, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad we got to interview. And, the, and I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. All right. 
Rockstar Nation, thank you for listening to Real Estate Rockstars. Listen, I need a favor. If you find this free content helpful, if you find our downloadable items from each guest helpful, please, I need you to pull out your pointing finger. Yes, the one finger that points at people and hit subscribe. Yes, subscribe. The more subscribers we get, the better we look in the ratings and the easier it is to get guests like Robert Kiyosaki, Barbara Corcoran, all the players that are on million dollar listing in the different cities. All that stuff makes it easier the more subscribers we get. So please subscribe. And listen, there's a lot of places you can leave comments. There's a lot of places you can like. We're on Facebook. We have an Instagram page. Instagram page is I am Pat Hyben. The Facebook is Real Estate Rockstars Radio. Feel free to leave us comments there. The most popular form of commenting seems to happen on YouTube. Yes, for whatever reason, it's a a very open environment. So just go to YouTube and go to Real Estate Rockstars Radio. Leave us comments there. Some of them we will read on the show. We love your feedback. So thanks, guys, and I hope you are having a great day. Oh, and also, listen, if you're going to subscribe and you haven't already left a review on iTunes, please do that too. Have a great day and thanks so much, Rockstar Nation. I really appreciate you.